national paths and transnational actors who contest the West world order, but also for new voices to be heard in the form of civil and social movements across the globe. So how do we define wars and peace in the 21st century? Can peace exist without social justice? What types of war are we facing when more than 100 conflicts are taking place across the globe? What are the opportunities and challenges offered by artificial intelligence, by technolo technological change to face these crises? Of course, I will not be reckless enough to try and answer those questions myself, especially in front of so many experts. But those questions will form some of the underlying themes of this sixth edition of the Youth and Leaders Summit. And I'm sure that we're all very keen to witness the debates to which they're likely to give rise. I would like to thank all the speakers for agreeing to take part in the summit, for sharing their thinking with us, and most importantly, for their willingness to be challenged by our students. And of course, I'd like to thank with a special warmth all the staff and students of our Paris School of International Affairs for having thrown so much talent, so much passion into organizing this event. And if you'll allow me, I'd like to add one last word. Although we're in a bright mood today, as is only natural in anticipation of great discussions and great debates, I find it necessary to remind us all of the terrible situation which is faced by one of us, one of our colleagues, Fariba Adelha, who's a researcher at Sciences Po in our Center for International Studies. Fariba, as some of you probably know, is currently detained in Iran for no other reason than trying to do her job. As we start this summit, Fariba has been deprived of her freedom for close to 600 days. And dedicating this event to her is for me a way of stressing that she's constantly present in our minds and in our hearts and that we can know no respite until she regains her freedom. Without further ado, let me hand over to the extraordinary Dean of PSIA, President Enrico Letta. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, dear Frédéric Mion, Director de Sciences Po. Thank you very much all for uh, this great event that we are now uh, uh, about to start. Uh, I'm really very happy because we are at the sixth edition of this idea that we started uh, six years ago, five years ago, January uh, 16, when we started debating on the role of the UN at that time, the role of the successor of Ban Ki-moon, uh, we discussed on the future of multilateralism. And we are today uh, in a discussion on wars and peace that is similar for some aspects. The world has changed very much. The new situation in the US, what is happening in Asia, new conflicts around the world, a new complicated, hopeful situation in uh, uh, Europe too. Many topics where the old discussion around wars and peace seems to be today full of meanings. This is why under the leadership of Lakdar Brahimi, I would like to thank Lakdar very much because uh, his leadership of the organizing committee of uh, the Youth and Leaders Summit is always wise and full of ideas. We are able this year to have this event, of course, online, but through the online procedures, we are able to have more speakers, as Frédéric Mion just said, to have more panels and to have more opportunities for interaction with students because the, the speakers accepted to give the students and all of us the privilege to have breakout sessions where they can uh, uh, discuss and interact with very small group of students. So the interaction is, be, is possible and can be really uh, very, very uh, useful. Maybe better, I don't know, uh, rather than the physical interaction, uh, we will see next year and we will see what will be the activity of uh, and our mission 
in terms of education after the pandemic. We will try to combine the best of the two worlds. I have to say that uh, uh, this event uh, that we are uh, beginning now uh, will last for three days. That is unique. In the past, we had just one entire day uh, of working activities. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, the, this change will be uh, very useful to have more people connected. Uh, of course, we are in three days because we can work only in hours that are allowing all the people connected from the US and from Asia to be present. Uh, our students are today physically in the US or in uh, Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, and the rest of Europe. So time zone oblige us to work uh, in, in uh, three days. And today, the first day, will be a fantastic kickoff with the uh, Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, and in the afternoon with other two guest speakers, keynote speakers, uh, the High Representative and Vice President of the European Commission uh, in charge for foreign and security policy, Joseph Borrell, and la Ministre Française des Armées, Madame Florence Parly, que nous remercierons cet après-midi à 5 heures de tout notre cœur pour la clôture qui sera de notre journée. So, I think the possibility and the opportunity for our students to interact, to pose questions, to uh, interact with the leaders and the speakers will be really unique. So, without further ado, I stop here immediately. I give the floor to our first keynote speaker, Jens Stoltenberg, uh, Secretary General of NATO, former Prime Minister of Norway, a well-known expert and a fantastic uh, partner with our students for many opportunities to understand better the situation. I would, I would like to end up also thanking the entire Sciences Po uh, through the director, Frédéric Mion, who is with us uh, this morning for the support that Sciences Po as a whole gave always to this idea of the Youth and Youth Summit and the support uh, in this sex, sixth edition uh, as well. I'd like also to thank the New York Times uh, as Frederic just uh, did, uh, because it is the fourth edition uh, with this fantastic partnership with the New York Times. Thank you so much. And of course, our uh, sponsor uh, this year, Microsoft. I stop here. Uh, dear Jens, dear Secretary General uh, Jens Stoltenberg, uh, uh, I give you the floor for your introductory remarks. Then. Uh, the interaction with students will follow. We are on YouTube now, so I'm very pleased to uh, say hello to all those who are not students, who are not professors uh, of our community, but who are interested in what will happen. Of course, students will have the opportunity to uh, interact with their questions, and then the rest of the day will follow. Thank you so much, Jens, dear Secretary General, you have the floor. Thank you so much and uh, good afternoon to you all in Paris or wherever you find yourself uh, in these uh, Corona times. And thank you, uh, Dean Letta, Der Enrico, for inviting me to speak at the uh, International Science Po uh, Youth and Leaders Summit. It is actually a special pleasure to address one of France's top uh, educational institutions, because France is a key NATO ally, a founding member of, of our alliance, and for over 70 years, it has played a crucial role in safeguarding peace. When I look back to my own years as a student uh, at the University of Oslo, the world was a very different place. In 1987, I wrote my thesis on macroeconomic planning under uncertainty, on how to manage fluctuating oil revenues. Little did I know then about what uncertainty would look like today. 
It was the time of the Cold War, the time when NATO had to focus on a single adversary, the Soviet Union. And when the line between war and peace was clearer. Today, this is a more blurred line. We need to deal with multiple threats coming from state and non-state actors and from multiple directions on land, at sea, in the air, in space and in cyberspace. Our adversaries challenge us using bombs and aircraft, but also bots and algorithms. In this more unpredictable world, we face a more assertive Russia, brutal terrorist groups like ISIS, more sophist sophisticated cyber attacks, intensifying geopolitical competition with the rise of China, potentially dangerous new technologies, disruption to, uh, due to climate change and deadly viruses. For NATO, <clears throat> this means we need to be prepared for any threat and any challenge at any time. And this is actually what we are doing. Let me give you some examples. After years of cutting defense spending, all allies are investing more in defense. For the first time, we have deployed combat ready forces to the east of our alliance in response to Russia's aggressive actions. We're working together to deal with the security impact of the rise of China and new technologies. And we have designated cyberspace and space as operational domains. And our militaries are supporting civilian efforts to counter the coronavirus. So NATO is doing more, but the world is moving faster than ever before. So we need to adapt even faster. That is why NATO leaders asked me to conduct a reflection on the future of the Alliance. It is why I launched the NATO 2030 initiative and why engaging with tomorrow's leaders like you is so valuable. Because you were born into this unpredictable world. You have the greatest stake in our security and you must have your say in the future of NATO. So I have appointed a group of emerging young leaders from across the lines to advise me on NATO 2030. They will share their ideas with me in early February. At the same time, NATO will host 10 prestigious universities, including Sciences Po, to compete in NATO's first ever policy hackathon to develop disruptive ideas on NATO's future. My conversation with you today is part of my broader engagement with young people, civil society, and the private sector. It will help me formulate my recommendations on NATO 2030, which I will present at the next NATO summit in Brussels later this year. <clears throat> NATO 2030 has three priorities. To keep our alliance militarily strong, make it politically stronger, and ensure it takes a more global approach. Let me take each of these in turn. So first, for a strong military alliance, we have to invest. To have the right forces with the right equipment and we have to keep our technological edge to remain competitive in a more competitive world. <clears throat> but to have strong militaries, we also need strong societies. That is why boosting resilience is a key task for NATO. We need more robust infrastructure, power grids, telecommunications, including 5G, ports, airports, roads, and railways. And we need safer and more diverse supply lines. For example, for fuel, food, and as we have seen recently, for medical equipment. Resilience is a collective effort and it requires continued cooperation with partners like the European Union. 
Together, we must do more to identify and address gaps in our resilience. This means we need to take into account the risks related to foreign investments and foreign control of our critical assets, infrastructure, and technologies. Decisions on investments and ownership are not just financial or economic. We should not let short-term economic gains undermine long-term security interests. <clears throat> the second priority of NATO 2030 is to strengthen NATO as a political alliance. NATO is the only place where Europe and North America come together every single day. It is a unique political platform. We should use this more to discuss issues that affect our security, such as the consequences of climate change and to coordinate the use of our military, economic and political tools more effectively. This unique platform is also the best venue to address our differences. Because 30 allies don't always agree on everything. But when we disagree, we discuss and look for ways to solve our differences together. That is what we have always done. And that is what we are doing today. For example, to deal with tensions in the East and Mediterranean. NATO provides the platform for Greece and Turkey to come together. We have developed a mechanism between the two allies to help prevent dangerous incidents and accidents and to pave the way for diplomatic discussions to settle the underlying disputes. The third priority for NATO 2030 is to ensure our alliance takes a more global approach. NATO should remain a regional organization for Europe and North America, but the challenges we face are global. From terrorism to nuclear proliferation, pandemics to disinformation campaigns, and of course, the return of great power competition with the rise of China. China is not an adversary, and its rise presents opportunities for our economies and our trade. But there are also serious challenges. China has the world's second largest defense budget. It continues to invest massively in military modernization. And China does not share our values. It does not respect human rights. It bullies other countries and tries to undermine the international rules-based order. Neither America nor Europe can deal with such challenges on their own. That is why I don't believe in America alone, just as I don't believe in Europe alone. I believe in America and Europe together. Because together in NATO, we represent half of the world's economic might and half of the world's military might. So we must adopt a more global approach and build a community of democracies together with existing partners like Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and South Korea, and possibly new ones like Brazil and India. We must step up to defend our values and protect our way of life. Dear students, I started by telling you about my university thesis on the uncertainty created by fluctuating oil prices. The message of my thesis was that we cannot get rid of uncertainty, but we can find a way to manage uncertainty. Today, this same message is true when it comes to our security. We do not know what the next crisis will be. So we have to be prepared for the unforeseen. Therefore, we need a strategy to deal with uncertainty. We have one. That strategy is NATO. All for one, one for all. 
so that regardless of what happens, we can keep our nation safe and free. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, dear Secretary General, dear Jens, for your introductory remarks, for uh, having focused on uh, NATO 2030 as a key point of our discussion. Thank you for uh, sharing with us some of the ideas around this perspective. Uh, we have some questions. Uh, I start by reading the questions and I, I would like, of course, to ask you to, to answer these questions. Uh, first one is from uh, Anna Lucia. The question is about, I think we will uh, uh, pose this question, the same question this afternoon to uh, uh, your good friend, Josep uh, Borrell, to, to listen also uh, his answer. And the question from Anna Lucia is, what is NATO's view in regards to the prospect of a stronger European security union? Uh, we know very well that the debate uh, in Europe uh, about uh, strategic autonomy is a debate that is a crossing debate with the future of NATO and NATO 2030 uh, discussion. So I think maybe it is the best way to start uh, our interaction. And the question from Anna Lucia is the perfect uh, kickoff. Uh, I give you the floor. I strongly welcome uh, efforts by the European Union uh, to strengthen its uh, uh, work when it comes to uh, defense. Um, that has actually been something that NATO has called for for many, many years. Um, uh, because if uh, more EU efforts on defense uh, means increased defense investments, uh, then of course that's something we welcome. And I believe that more uh, efforts by EU on defense will require more investments. And that's absolutely in line with what NATO has been asking for for many, many years, and we will welcome that. Uh, the same, uh, increased EU efforts on defense um, uh, will help to develop new capabilities, uh, uh, also available for NATO allies, uh, also something we have been calling for many, many times. Uh, and we welcome those efforts by the European Union. And I also think that EU efforts on defense uh, will be important for another reason, and that is that it will hopefully be a way, at least that's a stated goal of these efforts, to address the fragmentation of the European defense industry. That's politically very sensitive, but it is important. Um, just to give you one example, in the United States, they have many, many battle tanks, and they have only one type of main battle tanks. So the cost of maintenance, uh, 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 development, training, uh, uh, spare parts goes down because they have the, you have the economy of scale, many tanks, uh, uh, same type, low cost per unit. In Europe, there are much fewer Basel tanks and there are nine different. So the cost of maintenance, training, spare parts, all that increases. The unit cost goes, goes up. So this fragmentation, the lack of ability to develop one system adds very much to the cost of providing defense in Europe. And battle tanks is only one example. Uh, my good friend, Josep Borrell, uh, have a long list, uh, and he uses this, uh, this example many, many times, uh, of many other capabilities, ships, planes, drones, all over. You have the same problem of lack of economy of scale because of the fragmentation of the European defense industry. So not only do they spend too little, but what they get out of that is also uh, 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 much too little because the cost is so high because of the fragmentation. So. Um, I believe that EU efforts on defense, and that's the stated goal, will address these challenges. Too few capabilities, too much fragmentation, uh, too little spending. So in that sense, and in that way, uh, uh, EU efforts on defense is something I really, really welcome, support, and I've actually called for for many years. But we have to also know and recognize that EU efforts on defense cannot replace NATO should not compete with NATO, can never be an alternative to NATO. Partly because less than 50% of the people living in NATO live in an EU country. Less than 50% of uh, GDP in NATO comes from an EU country. 
And we need to, of course, mobilize 100% of our resources and protect 100% of the uh, people. And only 20% of NATO's defense expenditure come from uh, 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 EU members, from, uh, from uh, NATO uh, EU members. Um, uh, so EU efforts cannot replace, EU cannot defend Europe. Uh, uh, NATO is for uh, the uh, NATO members in Europe, uh, the bedrock for uh, our uh, security. Uh, this is partly about money. 20% uh, of the defense expenditure come from EU allies. It's also partly about geography. Uh, Norway in the north, uh, 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 Turkey in the south, uh, and in the West, of course, uh, uh, the United States, Canada, but also United Kingdom are critical for European uh, security, for the defense of uh, Europe. And then lastly, this is also about politics, because any attempt to divide uh, uh, Europe uh, from North America, to, 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 inc to increase the distance, to, to, to go alone, will not only weaken NATO, but it will divide Europe. Uh, so I don't believe in <laughs> America alone. I don't believe in Europe alone. I believe in uh, North America and Europe together. And as long as we stand together, uh, we are able to deal with any threats and any challenges. Alone, we are weaker. Together, we are uh, stronger. Uh, thank you. There are other questions on the same topic, so I would like to, uh, to put them together. Uh, Miruna, Luis, and Joanna. Uh, the questions are, first of all, on the, on the topic of burden sharing. You just mentioned this topic. What are, in your views, the steps to have uh, a more concrete burden sharing? Which timing? Uh, another point is about, uh, is there the possibility to have a, a cooperation with a different uh, missions? What domains for the European Union and which ones for NATO, for instance? Uh, and the other one is about uh, uh, the, the structural changes. Do you see the need of structural uh, institutional reforms uh, at, at NATO level in the relationship with the European Union and in the uh, way to organize a more uh, effective institutional framework for the cooperation between uh, the European Union and uh, NATO? <coughs> I think it's always important to have an open mind uh, and uh, also look into structural uh, uh, issues. And actually, over the last years, we have been able to, to lift the NATO-EU cooperation to unprecedented levels. Um, uh, uh, I signed with uh, the former uh, presidents uh, of the European Union, uh, President uh, Donald Tusk and President uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, uh, uh, back in 2016 and then later on in 2018, uh, 18, I think it was, uh, two joint declarations uh, outlining 74 different areas where Europe, uh, EU and NATO can work uh, uh, more together. And we are now stepping up uh, when it comes to cyber, uh, uh, maritime uh, uh, exercises, and in many other areas, we are working more closely together, uh, Europe uh, or EU and NATO, than we have ever done before. And that's not strange because uh, more than 90% uh, of the people living in EU live in a NATO country. So, of course, uh, it, it makes, and, and we share the same neighborhood, we share many of the same threats and challenges. Of course, it makes a lot of sense that we work uh, together, despite the fact that we are two different organizations, and of course, also uh, uh, covering uh, um, um, uh, some uh, different responsibilities. Uh, so, so, yes, uh, we, we should always look into how we can further strengthen, how we can further develop our, our uh, uh, cooperation partnership. And, and I'm proud, and, and I know that. This is also something uh, both uh, uh, High Representative, uh, Vice President Josep Borrell, uh, who will speak later on uh, to you, but also uh, uh, President Ursula von der Leyen, President Charles Michel, they also support this idea of, of strengthening further the cooperation between uh, NATO and the European uh, Union. Part of that of can, can of also, of course, be a structural discussion. I'm just afraid to make structure the most important thing. 
uh, we have structures, we, we have institutions. So what we need is political will and, uh, and, uh, and the strength to implement actions. So uh, I'm not against structural changes. I'm only uh, a bit uh, afraid of making the structures the main issue instead of the content, what we actually do together, uh, the main uh, issue. And that has been the focus of, uh, of uh, uh, the leadership in EU and, and, and me, myself. Uh, uh, I, I recently, for instance, for as the first Secretary General NATO ever met with a whole uh, college, uh, college of uh, EU commissioners, uh, President von der Leyen invited me, and that was a great honor to meet them all, discuss, uh, and of course, what NATO does matters for uh, EU in many ways, and vice versa, on, on military mobility, transportation, resilience, uh, 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 telecommunications, uh, uh, all that is important for EU, but also important for NATO, and, uh, and of course it matters that we, we coordinate as much as, as, uh, as possible. Um, then um, uh, you, uh, burden sharing was one of the uh, issues. <clears throat> the burden sharing is important, uh, and I think we have to understand that different US uh, uh, presidents have stated again and again that it is unfair uh, that uh, 70% uh, of uh, NATO's defense expenditure uh, comes from the United States. Uh, uh, and as I said, 20% uh, from uh, EU NATO allies and then the rest from countries like uh, uh, United Kingdom, Turkey, Canada, uh, Norway, and so on, uh, uh, non-EU uh, 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 European countries and, uh, and Canada. Um, uh, 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 while 50% of NATO's GDP comes from uh, non-US uh, allies. Uh, it was actually Barack Obama, President Obama that was very strong on this back at the NATO summit uh, in 2014, where all NATO allies agreed that we should spend more. Uh, the good news is that uh, we have follow up uh, on the commitment we made in 2014. So now all NATO allies have invested more uh, and have added extra, uh, and that has, uh, we still have a long way to go, but more allies now meet a 2% guideline than ever before, uh, uh, up from three in 2014 to 10 uh, now. Uh, uh, so, so that's a, a huge difference. And the timeline, which, 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 which was also part of the question, is that we decided in 2014 uh, 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 to move towards uh, spending 2%, uh, uh, of GDP on defense within a decade, meaning 2024. Uh, 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 so um, burden sharing uh, is important. The good news is that we are making progress uh, and that's also part of the adaptation, uh, uh, the uh, re-energized uh, strength of, uh, of NATO. Let me add one more thing and then I promise to, to stop, is that of course the, uh, the incoming administration uh, uh, offers a unique opportunity to revitalize, to re-energize uh, uh, the cooperation uh, North, uh, North America, uh, Europe in NATO. And I look forward to, uh, to, to working with uh, uh, the next president, President Biden, on uh, especially these issues. Uh, thank you. We have many questions on, on the US, on President Biden. I will... Uh uh leave this question maybe for a second part of our discussion because there was an interesting question on on russia and i would like to to ask you um uh, nato constantly expanded to countries from the former soviet sphere of influence asks uh, renault uh, what do you respond to those who consider that that is a fuel to russian nationalism so the relationship with Russia and the relationship with countries uh, that were part of uh, USSR. And uh, if I may add uh, a question, uh, the question is about also the frozen conflicts on the borders of Russia. I, you mentioned your thesis. I uh, have to mention my PhD thesis. In, in this period, we we were during the Nagorno-Karabakh explosion of the conflict. And Nagorno-Karabakh is uh, since then, and it is still one of these uh, conflicts uh, in the last months, not, not, not only frozen, but also very, uh, very uh, hot conflict. Uh, what, what do you think about all these frozen conflicts? Because we have, we had in these years, in these 
uh, in uh, South Ossetia or in Donbas, more and more part of these uh, former USSR uh, uh, regions that are today in this very difficult situation. Uh, do you see any possibilities to overcome uh, these uh, complicated issues? Do you see a role for NATO? Uh, do you see uh, other exit strategies? Um, the topic is, is a very hot one. Yes, absolutely. First, on this issue about NATO enlargement and uh, whether that has fueled Russian nationalism. Uh, as if, in a way, and I've heard that question phrased in different ways many times, uh, uh, as if, in a way, the enlargement of NATO has been some kind of aggressive action against Russia, has, has, has justified uh, Russia's uh, use of force against uh, other countries, like you mentioned, uh, uh, Donbas uh, uh, and uh, and Georgia and uh, and so on, uh, and and as if the enlargement of NATO is a kind of un un unacceptable, uh, uh, yeah, assertive behavior of uh, of NATO. I think we have to to start with the basics. The basics is that all countries in Europe have signed the Helsinki Final Act, and also many other documents which clearly states that all nations have the sovereign right of choosing their own path. And to be honest for me, you don't need the Helsinki Final Act to, uh, to agree with that. It's so obvious that sovereign nations should have and must have the right to decide their own path, including what kind of security arrangements they want to be part of or not want to be part of. So, it's the whole idea that, in a way, NATO has been very assertive, aggressive by moving eastwards, by 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 enlarging with countries uh, uh, that were formerly part of the Warsaw Pact, uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, uh, at that time Czechoslovakia, and Czechia, and the Republic, also, and uh, and and Slovakia, and and uh, and many other countries in Eastern and Central Europe, and including some former. Uh, 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 countries which uh, uh, also which which used to be uh, republics or part of the Soviet Union, the Baltic uh, countries. Uh, you have to understand that that's sovereign decisions by them. It's not NATO forcing its way eastwards. It's these countries that, through democratic processes, decide that they want to be members of NATO, and then NATO's door is open. Uh, we will never force a country to join. So when a good uh, friend and neighbor, uh, Finland or Sweden, uh, uh, have for decades decided that they don't want to be members of NATO, we totally respect that. But when uh, countries like Latvia, uh, Estonia, uh, Lithuania, Poland, uh, and many others, Romania, decide that they want to be members, of course, if they meet the NATO standards, they should be allowed to be members. And the most important thing is that whether these countries are going to be members of NATO or not is for NATO and uh, and the country to decide. This, Russia has no no right to try to intervene or to block or to stop the membership of a sovereign na uh, nation in into uh, NATO. And sometimes I use my own country as an example, because the idea is that since since Russia since Moscow don't like or dislike that uh, Lithuania joined uh, uh, NATO, they should never have been allowed to join. Well, if you apply the same thinking on my own country, Norway, we joined in 1949. Norway is a neighbor of Russia. Russia didn't, or the Soviet Union at that time didn't like that Norway joined. Stalin actually expressed clearly that he wants Norway to stay out of NATO. But luckily, the leadership in NATO in that, at that time, in Paris, in, in, in London, in, in Washington and elsewhere, they said, no, Norway, the neighbor of Russia, has the sovereign right to decide its own path. They want to become member. They meet the NATO standards, so we welcome them. And that's exactly the same. We have said uh, to other independent countries, uh, for instance, the Baltic countries, uh, when they wanted to join uh, some years ago. So, so for me, it's almost a provocation, just in a way question the right of sovereign nations to decide their own future. That, that's, that's in a way to accept sphere of influences. It's to accept that big nations have a kind of say over neighbors. I don't want to live in that kind of world. 
because I'm coming from a small country neighboring a big country. And if we accept that big countries can decide what small neighbors can do or not do, then we're back to the old times where the big powers decided over the small countries. We don't want that kind of world. We want a world built build on rules, uh, uh, on, on, on uh, respect uh, for nations, regardless of the size of the armed forces or their economies or whatever. So, so this is about fundamental principles. And if we start to compromise on that, we are on a very dangerous path towards a place we should not end. And that's my also answer to when, when it comes to, to for instance, uh, also that's a kind of bridge to some of the issues you, you, you raised about uh, the frozen conflicts. Georgia wants to become a member of NATO. And that's not for Russia to, 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 uh, to stop. Whether Georgia becomes a member of NATO or not, is for Georgia and NATO allies to decide, and only them. Because anything else would be to infringe the sovereign rights of sovereign independent countries. And then, of course, you can, you can have different arguments, but it's not for Russia to decide what Georgia has to do. It's for Georgia and NATO allies. Um, and therefore, what they have done in Abkhazia, in South Ossetia, uh, violating the territorial integrity, the sovereignty of Georgia, an independent country, is unacceptable. The same with Ukraine, of course, illegal annexation of Crimea, uh, destabilizing uh, Donbas, eastern Ukraine. It's violating absolute fundamental principles uh, in the way we should create a peaceful, stable uh, world. NATO's role is to provide support to these countries, uh, capacity building, uh, help with reforms, uh, NATO allies provide training. Uh, we have presence in different ways uh, in both uh, Georgia and Ukraine. Uh, um, uh, but of course, we need to find uh, political solutions, uh, different conflicts, uh, Moldova, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, you mentioned, uh, uh, different conflicts, but, but, but the main message is that is that we should respect the sovereignty. Uh, and of course, we should also uh, uh, look for political solutions. And, and, and NATO supports the different efforts to find political negotiated solutions to the different uh, uh, conflicts, more or less uh, frozen. Uh, there are two questions on, on the US and on the new president uh, and the new US administration. Two students, uh, Anat, and Martha. The first question is, is exactly about the fact that uh, Trump was not a great friend of multilateralism. We know uh, very well this point. But we have to say that maybe NATO was the only multilateral forum where he was a little bit, a little bit more involved. And he was not only uh, involved, but he was asking uh, a more a bigger involvement, engagement, uh, as you said, from the different uh, allies and from the European allies. So how do you foresee the change and the role of the new administration, uh, President Biden's administration? What do you expect? Uh, and, uh, and the second point is related, that's uh, another interesting question, Martha, saying that given that the threat to stability in the US is increasingly internal, how would increased defense investment effectively address this threat and its causes? So do you see um, a deal or a contradiction in the US between the need for more internal defense investment and the need for uh, the U.S. to be uh, present at world at world level. What do you think about uh, these two uh, very large and, and very complicated issues? First of all, I have to clearly state that it's not for me to speak uh, on behalf of an incoming uh, a new administration in the United States of America, uh, a NATO ally. What I can say is that. Uh, uh, I look forward to working with uh, President uh, uh, Joe uh, Biden uh, when he assumes office in a few days this week, and also with the incoming uh, 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 new Vice President uh, Kamala Harris. Um, uh, I spoke with uh, uh, Joe Biden be, uh, so after the elections, and uh, and I know him as a 
as a very strong <coughs> supporter of <coughs> NATO, of uh, multilateral institutions, of multilateral cooperation, <coughs> and he knows NATO very well because <coughs> he has um, served as vice president, uh, and I had the honor of working with him in that capacity. Uh, and also in my previous position as uh, uh, Prime Minister of Norway, I also had the privilege of working with uh, then uh, both uh, uh, Vice President uh, Joe Biden, but also in his capacity as Chairman of the Senate's Foreign Relations uh, Committee. So he knows Europe, he knows NATO. He's, uh, uh, he has publicly over many, many years uh, been a strong supporter of, uh, of the transatlantic bond. And, and I'm absolutely confident that uh, when he assumes office, uh, that will provide a a platform to re-energize, to revitalize uh, the transatlantic uh, bond. Of course, <clears throat> uh, that doesn't mean that there will be zero challenges and no problems, but uh, 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 the value of sitting around the same table uh, uh, is recognized. Uh, and, uh, and I think we, we, we have to understand that NATO is unique because there are many, it's the only institution where North America and Europe meet every day. Uh, we have, of course, many ministerial meetings, we have summits, uh, we have, uh, uh, but we have this day-to-day -day presence uh, in the NATO headquarters uh, with the political cooperation, the political staff, the ambassadors. We have the command structures, the NATO bases, the NATO missions and operations uh, in Afghanistan, in, in Europe, uh, in many other places, uh, bringing together North America and Europe on a daily basis, on all levels, uh, bringing us together. And that in itself, uh, creates a, 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 a partnership, a friendship, a trust, uh, which is of great importance uh, for uh, the transatlantic bond, the key, the, 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 the bedrock of the transatlantic uh, bond. And I'm absolutely confident that he and his administration will uh, build on, uh, on that. <clears throat> then uh, uh, burden sharing. Um, um, so burden sharing is, is, um, is, is it's, 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 it's part of that, uh, because um, we have to realize that there is a very strong bipartisan support for NATO in the, in the United States, um, uh, Democrats and Republicans. And, and, and when you look at the opinion polls, actually now there is record high support for NATO in the United States. And I'm absolutely confident that one of the reasons we see this is that uh, they see that European allies and Canada are stepping up when it comes to burden sharing. We still have a long way to go, but, but we have taken uh, it seriously, not only to please the United States, but because we see that we live in a more unpredictable, more dangerous world, uh, uh, with everything from ISIS, uh, changing uh, global balance of power, uh, cyber threats, so we need to invest more in our uh, security. Um, and that is recognized in the United States, and I'm absolutely certain that also the incoming Biden administration would, of course, be uh, focused on burden sharing. You have to remember that uh, uh, Joe Biden, he was vice president when President Obama made this an important issue at the NATO summit in 2014, when we made the decision uh, to start to increase defense uh, spending, and European allies have uh, delivered. Then, also, I, I think that... Of course, there are many domestic challenges in all NATO allied countries. And uh, over the last weeks, we have seen clearly exposed some of those challenges in our biggest ally, the United States. Uh, but I think it's absolutely possible for the United States, as it is for other allies, to both address domestic challenges, uh, 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 unrest, whatever it is, um, and at the same time, see the value of uh, protecting ourselves against external threats and challenges. Uh, and, uh, and actually, if anything, I think that uh, the more we're able to prove uh, to the United States that uh, NATO is, um, is relevant for them, and we are striving for fair burden sharing, uh, the, the more support uh, and the stronger uh, uh, support we will have uh, from across uh, uh, the United States to our uh, alliance. So as so I don't, in a way, I don't accept in a way the contradiction uh, between either being focused on domestic challenges, which of course is important for all allies, also United States, uh, and or being focused on uh, external threats and challenges, which is the main responsibility of uh, NATO. Uh, if anything, I think that the more successful we are in 
showing that NATO delivers, uh, NATO, we stand together, we help each other. Uh, it also helps uh, the United States to address uh, some of the uh, challenges they see uh, domestically. Uh, let me just add one thing, and that is that uh, the rise of China, uh, the, the change in the global balance of power, makes NATO even more important for the United States. Uh, China will soon have the largest economy in the world. They already have the second largest defense budget. They are leading in some uh, technologies uh, which are also important for defense. Uh, we know disruptive technologies as, as uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, autonomous systems, facial recognition, all of this is also important when it comes to future uh, 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 defense systems. And therefore the United States need friends. And in NATO they have 29 friends and allies. And uh, if they are concerned about the size of China, then it's even more important to keep friends and allies close because together we are 50% of GDP, 50% of the world's military might. Uh, thank you. Uh, there are two questions on uh, uh, the Mediterranean, on Turkey and the Mediterranean. One from Aurélie and the other one is from Denise. Aurélie on Turkey, I think you you are expecting a question on Turkey. Turkey is incontournable in, uh, in this present situation. So uh, what, is your, uh, what are your explanations on uh, what will be the future of relationship be within uh, NATO allies? Um, Turkey is facing uh, a period in which relationship with the European Union, relationship with the US are very tense. Uh, what, uh, how do you see the situation there? How do you feel uh, the future? Uh, and, and Aurelie asks you also, uh, how will your personal diplomatic relationship with Erdogan are? And uh, so this is on, on Turkey and the other one on the Mediterranean, it's, I think it's related. Uh, is there the possibility to have uh, a more focus from NATO on the southern flank? And would such a commitment dilute the alliance's attention to the eastern flank? In, in a few words, is there a contradiction in being uh, involved in, in the south, uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, and in, in the rest of the scenarios? Let me start with the last uh, part of that question. Uh, um, again, NATO has to be ready and NATO is ready and capable of dealing with threats from whatever direction. Um, uh, we cannot focus on one direction. Uh, we need to be prepared for threats, challenges uh, from the east, from the south, from the west, from the north, uh, and also from cyberspace. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, uh, we cannot, we cannot we cannot accept and we should never end in a situation where we have to choose between either focusing in that direction or in another direction. Uh, because there will be surprises and we cannot tell from where the, the next crisis will happen. J just to illustrate, you know, we, we, I, I guess there were a lot of uh, analysis and assessments and intelligence uh, 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 in the 90s about wh what was the most risky, what was the most likely attack against NATO. I think hardly anyone imagined that the biggest attack on NATO would go, was going to happen in the United States against the Twin Towers and Pentagon and, uh, and the United States. So actually that happened in the West, uh, organized from Afghanistan in the Far East, or at least East. So, so I'm, just, I'm saying this because this idea that we should, we, we, should, we have to be because we cannot foresee the future, therefore we have to be prepared for the unforeseen in all directions. And that mind has to be there, because if not, we will be too narrow-minded and we will not be able to uh, uh, respond in a proper way. Um, uh, second, it's a bit artificial. Also, I, I agree that something is north and something is south and west and east. I agree that that's ge geographical directions. But from a security perspective, it's a bit artificial uh, to, uh, to put that into these categories. Because when we speak about the East, we often think about Russia. And we see a more assertive Russia in the East. But we see them also in the South. 
we see much more Russian presence now in North Africa, in Libya, uh, in other parts of North Africa, in the Middle East, in Syria. Uh, uh, we see them in the north, in the Arctic, uh, in the Polar Sea, in the Barents Sea, with, uh, with uh, a new military bases, with more naval presence, new submarines. Uh, and these submarines, they can travel around. Uh, so, so if we are concerned about Russia, then Russia is also in the north, in the south, and also sometimes in the west. So my message is that NATO has to be able to address challenges uh, from all directions at the same time, and they actually merge, they go together, uh, uh, because, uh, for instance, cyberspace is all over. Um, uh, then on Turkey, um, there is no way to hide, and I have never tried to do so, that there are uh, disagreements and differences uh, within uh, uh, NATO. Uh, and, uh, and the allies have expressed their concerns about uh, uh, different issues, uh, like, for instance, the, the Turkish decision to acquire uh, the Russian air defense system uh, S-400 or the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean um, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and other, uh, uh, other issues. I have raised those concerns myself, uh, and I had many discussions in Ankara uh, about these issues and, 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 and express my concerns, for instance, about the consequences of the Turkish decision to acquire uh, S-400. Uh, but I be, at the same time, I believe that, um, that our task is to look for way, ways forward to address uh, these concerns and to make sure that NATO uh, is the platform we actually are uh, uh, providing a meeting place for allies to sit down, discuss, have open, frank discussions when there are disagreements, uh, to try to find uh, ways uh, forward, uh, positive approaches. And that's exactly what we have done uh, uh, when it comes to the Eastern Mediterranean, um, uh, North Africa, uh, Libya, uh, uh, or other uh, uh, issues. Um, and we have been able to make some progress. Uh, for instance, uh, establishing the de-confliction mechanism between two uh, NATO allies, Greece and Turkey, uh, is important uh, because we have seen before, we actually saw in the 1990s that similar tensions between Turkey and Greece in the same uh, area in the uh, Mediterranean and also in the Aegean Sea actually led to casualties, uh, uh, to downing of planes, uh, helicopters uh, and, uh, and fatalities. We need to avoid these kind of uh, uh, incidents, accidents uh, uh, now, as we have seen before, uh, because they are dangerous, uh, they can lead to the loss of lives, and they can uh, spiral out, out of control. And that's exactly why we have established this mechanism at NATO with a, a hotline between the two countries. They meet, uh, we have technical military uh, communications, uh, uh, they have agreed to cancel some military exercises in in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, all of this, uh, and we are looking into how we can expand this mechanism, all of this to reduce risks for incidents and accidents. We have seen some already, but we need to prevent them from happening again uh, and become more serious. Um, and we also believe that the NATO efforts on military deconfliction um, is a way to pave the way and, and help to support uh, uh, political negotiations on the real underlying uh, issues, uh, uh, disagreements between uh, Greece and Turkey in the Eastern Mediterranean. And we have seen also some positive step in that direction, the resumption of, uh, of talks between uh, Greece and Turkey. So I'm not saying this is easy, but I'm saying that NATO's role is to bring allies together and, and, and look for ways to find solutions. Also because I think we have to understand that, uh, uh, yes, there are concerns and, and, and disagreements, uh, but at the same time, Turkey is an important ally. Uh, they have um, uh, the second biggest army in NATO. Uh, we can just look at the map. Geography matters. Um, uh, they have a strategic uh, location. Uh, the only NATO ally bordering Iraq and Syria uh, have helped us in the fight against terrorism, uh, helped to liberate the territories controlled by uh, ISIS in Iraq and Syria. Uh, NATO uses an infrastructure in Turkey to support that fight. We have the AWACS surveillance uh, planes flying out of Konya, a Turkish base, uh, helping uh, the, the coalition to defeat uh, Daesh, ISIS. 
um, uh, and no NATO ally ha- hosts more refugees than Turkey, and no NATO ally have suffered more terrorist attacks. So, 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 so we need to stand together. Yes, there are differences, but then NATO provides the best platform to sit down and address those differences. Uh, there are some questions on, on climate change. And of course, it will be one of the topics that in this Youth Leader Summit will be uh, focused. Or there will be one entire panel on this topic. So it would be very interesting for us to have your uh, take on, on, on that. So Stanislas, Arnaud, Joan, different questions, but uh, the questions are all focused on the, is there a role for NATO? in facing uh, issues as, as climate change? Is there a strategy uh, in NATO 2030 on these topics? Uh, um, what role can NATO play in cross-border environmental challenges? Uh, what is your uh, reaction on, uh, on, on these questions? Climate change is extremely important. Um, and. Uh, Climate change is important for many reasons, uh, also because it affects our security. Uh, rising sea levels, um, warm weather, more extreme weather, more flooding, uh, more wildfires uh, will directly affect the livelihood of people all over the world. But it will also uh, be a, a conflict multiplier force people to move, uh, increase competition about scarce resources, water, uh, uh, land, uh, and so on. Uh, so in that sense, uh, climate change is also a security issue. And therefore, NATO has to address uh, climate change. And, uh, and NATO 2030 is uh, also about how can NATO adopt, how can NATO respond, how can NATO in a better way deal with the security consequences of climate change. Of course, NATO is not going to, in a way, uh, be the main platform for negotiate climate uh, agreements like the Paris Accord. That's for the UN, that's for, for those institutions to do. And I think we all should support those efforts, not try to establish competing uh, structures. But NATO's responsibility is to address the security consequences of climate change. And that's partly just by analyzing, understanding, uh, 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 demonstrating the security consequences, because that will add to the urgency. That will make it easier for those who are negotiating climate agreements and, uh, and, and, and working for uh, mitigation efforts, uh, 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 measures to reduce emissions, I think they will give them one extra argument. I, I think they will have more than enough arguments, if they, but if they need an extra argument in combating climate change, uh, reducing uh, uh, emissions of greenhouse gases or uh, uh, global warming gases, uh, then security is uh, yet another argument for doing what they are already doing. So uh, I think by, by, by providing facts, by by being transparent, by, by analyzing the problem, the security consequences of climate change. We are hel helping all those in, in different uh, countries, in the UN system, uh, in the uh, uh, Climate Convention, um, uh, to, uh, to address these issues, and that's one role of NATO. We also need to understand the problem because we need, when we do our um, um, assessments of threats, of challenges, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, adopt our posture and prepare, then we need to understand the consequences of climate change for our military forces and, uh, and the conflicts we may be faced with in the future. And this is everything from, you know, for instance, the challenges you see emanating from the south, uh, the instability, uh, migration, refugees, uh, 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 but also very practical issues rising sea levels will affect our naval bases. Uh, we already see that many places in the world. Uh, 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 soldiers are operating out there in extreme weather or already in the high north or in the deserts and the jungles. And of course, equipment uh, uh, dealing with, for instance, extreme heat. We have a mission in Iraq. They have suffered, uh, they have seen the consequences of extreme heat in in Baghdad, in, in Iraq. Um, so, uh, so whatever we do uh, will also 
have to take into account more wilder, wetter, extreme weather uh, in different ways. And that, that will affect the development of capabilities, equipment for uh, uh, our personnel. And thirdly, NATO could also do its part to try to help reduce emissions. And therefore, I welcome that we have different programs in NATO uh, trying to reduce, for instance, the dependence on fossil fuels. Dutch soldiers increasingly use solar panels instead of diesel generators during operations. The United States and Canada are looking uh, at integrating solar panels into their soldiers' combat gear to power their electronic equipment, and all the NATO countries are, exper are experimenting with uh, hydrogen fuel uh, cells and batteries to generate and store electricity. I use these examples to illustrate that uh, whatever we can do to try to re increase energy efficiency of our battleships or our uh, battle tanks or our uh, operations and missions in general will be good for the environment. It will reduce emissions of greenhouse gases, but it will also uh, reduce the vulnerability of our forces. Because you know from many operations, for instance in Afghanistan, that just the transportation of fossil fuel, of diesel, is actually a very huge challenging task. And there is a, a need for a lot of fossil fuels, diesel, to generate, for instance, electricity uh, at the different camps we have. So uh, if we are able to switch to other, uh, more environmentally renewable, uh, uh, friendly uh, uh, sources of energy, we help uh, to reduce emissions of uh, uh, greenhouse gases, CO2, uh, global warming gases, but we also make our forces uh, less vulnerable and more resilient. So that's a double reason to do exactly that. And we are looking into it. We are working on it. Uh, we are, uh, 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 we are uh, stepping up and NATO 2030 is uh, very much about that. Uh, we are approaching the end of our uh, time, our conversation, but of course, there's full of questions on China. So I ask you to take the questions together and to try to, to give a, a, a global uh, answer. Robert, what will be the key steps for NATO to build a successful relationship with China? Luis, how can allies work together within NATO to address the rise and political assertiveness of China. Marlene, what is NATO's role in the South China Sea and East China Sea disputes? And Stanislas, a more general question is there, do you see a risk that NATO 2030 could further antagonize China? So uh, it's, it will be one of the most interesting topics. Uh, I have to say that, uh, and I take the opportunity also to announce to our students that uh, March the 3rd, we will dedicate uh, our usual Wednesday uh, to uh, focus on the G20, uh, because G20 this year will be probably the unique opportunity for Chinese leadership, US new leadership, and European leadership to be together. And so we will have the uh, Italian Sherpa, the president of uh, G20 this year, uh, addressing students, and it will be, I think, interesting. I say that because, of course, the relationship between China, US, and Europe are probably one of the most interesting focus in this period of uh, uh, of Biden uh, uh, taking uh, the lead of the US. So uh, many questions, uh, what, is your, what, is, what are your answers? My answer is that uh, China is not an adversary for uh, uh, NATO or to NATO. Um, uh, and actually the rise of China provides a lot of opportunities <clears throat> for all of us. Uh, for our economies, uh, for our trade, uh, and uh, we also have to understand that the rise of China has already fueled a lot of economic growth in Europe, in the United States, uh, and all over the world. Um, and of course, the rise of China has also been very important uh, when it comes to alleviating power, poverty, uh, uh, poverty, because uh, uh, because. Um, uh, 
the fact that hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of uh, poverty has uh, has uh, has been extremely also ha- the, the rise of China has been extremely uh, instrumental in doing exactly uh, that. So uh, uh, I will first recognize the the positive effects the the opportunities uh, uh, of uh, the rise of uh, China. But at the same time, we have to realize that there are some serious challenges. Um, China is a great power that doesn't share our values. For uh, several centuries, uh, uh, the biggest and strongest power in the world has been a, a country which has been sharing our values democracy, individual liberty, the rule of law. Uh, for some centuries, it was the United Kingdom, uh, then later on, uh, the United States of America. Uh, but now, soon, the, the biggest economy in the world will be uh, China. Uh, in purchasing power terms, uh, it has already surpassed uh, the United States. Uh, soon, it will also surpass uh, the size of the, uh, in the American economy in, in, in market value. Uh, so that's something new. Um, and, and, and the new thing is that the biggest economy in the world are, uh, is something we find in a country that doesn't share our values. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and we see the way they behave, partly against their own uh, population, in Hong Kong, uh, how they treat man- uh, minorities or, or the Uyghurs, uh, 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 millions of people being, being uh, uh, forced into different kinds of camps, um, uh, uh, heavy censorship, no freedom of speech, uh, no freedom of assembly, and a brutal social control with these social points, monitoring everything that goes on the internet. Uh, giving awards to those who behave in, in the right way and, and punishing those who behave in the wrong way. This is an authoritarian system which is using advanced new technologies to monitor, uh, to control their population in a way we have never seen before. But you also see how they behave uh, against uh, countries uh, also, uh, not only against their own population, but also against uh, other countries in the world. Australia called for an independent investigation into the, the sources of uh, COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Uh, China has punished them with uh, sanctions or restrictions uh, on, on trade and so on. Canada, they have uh, arrested Canadian uh, citizens uh, because they, 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 as a kind of uh, punishment for for uh, uh, for what Canada uh, did uh, in implementing rule of law in their own country, and I do, and I know this myself because I was a prime minister in Norway when the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded the peace prize uh, to a Chinese dissident, and they wanted Norway to uh, regret and criticize that decision, and since we didn't do that, they punished us. Uh, by blocking trade, blocking all political dialogue, blocking all meetings, uh, trying to inflict severe damage on the Norwegian economy as a punishment. So um, uh, they are bullying neighbors, bullying countries uh, all over the world, including, uh, for instance, Norway. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, that's a behavior which uh, we have to take very seriously. And therefore, I think we need to work even more closely with partners, like-minded democracies, as Australia, New Zealand, Korea, uh, uh, Japan, and we have a lot of, a lot of partners all, all over the world, but let's look into whether we can develop new partnerships uh, with, for instance, countries like India or Brazil. Uh, China is also strong militarily. Uh, uh, they are uh, developing new uh, nuclear weapons, uh, long-range missiles, second largest defense budget, uh, uh, new uh, naval capabilities, aircraft carriers, and so on. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is, this is something we have to take to in, in, into account. 
when and they're also leading in many of the technologies will, which will be important for the future uh, weapon systems uh, artificial intelligence facial recognitions and so on uh, so therefore we need to invest therefore we need to make sure that we maintain the technological edge uh, and that's exactly what we are uh, doing in nato uh, uh, partly to the uh, due to the uh, the shifting uh, global balance of uh, power and then we also have to realize uh, the challenges related to our infrastructure, the resilience of societies. We have a discussion about Huawei 5G, and we have seen a convergence of uh, 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 minds, positions, views in NATO over just the last year. <clears throat> I think we, <clears throat> and we have developed in NATO something we call resilience guidelines, based on requirements for resilience, uh, stating clearly that all allies have to have make sure that they have safe and secure telecommunications, uh, roads, airports, all the critical infrastructure. Uh, and therefore, we will need to also take into account the risks related to foreign ownership. And I think we have seen a very important discussion and also development in European countries and the United States, Canada, about the risks related to uh, 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 vulnerabilities in, for instance, 5G uh, networks. And that links to the question about the South China Sea and the East China Sea. <clears throat> NATO is not going to move into the South China Sea. Some NATO allies, uh, of course, sail there. It's about freedom of navigation. But NATO as an alliance is not going to uh, move into the South China Sea. Uh, but but that, that's not, not the issue. The issue is that chi China is coming close. We are not going to move in there, but they are coming closer to us in cyberspace investing our infrastructure in the Arctic, in Africa, uh, and also with weapon systems that can reach all NATO allies. So, so there is no way we can deny or hide or, or, or not take into account that there are security consequences of the rise of China that NATO has to address. Uh, we will do that in a way which doesn't antagonize or, or, or establish a new adversary, but we need to understand and also address the security consequences of a fundamental shift in the balance of power, which is caused by the rise of China. That is what NATO 30, 2030 is very much about. Uh, NATO remaining a regional alliance, but developing a stronger global approach because the threats and the challenges we face are more and more uh, global. Uh, thank, thank you. you there so are much. many other questions. I, I, it is not possible to take uh, all the questions, but I ask you in, in, a, in one minute to say maybe one word on two topics that will be uh, at the very uh, heart of our discussion in these very days, because we will have two panels uh, discussing, debating on space and on cyber. So Lisa and Berenike are asking space was declared an operational domain in uh, 2019, what concrete steps in NATO is NATO undertaking to strengthen its collective space capabilities? Berenik, responsibilities on space-related questions are extremely wide, widespread over NATO and member states. How can this misalignment be resolved? And on cyber, uh, the, the topics that Anna and Benji are asking are related to which kind of uh, steps do you see in the future and in uh, NATO 2030 uh, perspective uh, for having at the European level and at NATO level an upgrade uh, in the possibility to uh, respond uh, to cyber threats. I'm sorry because I know uh, we are at the end, but maybe if you give us just uh, uh, some, uh, some nuances of what you think uh, in these final minutes. Um, first, on uh, cyber, NATO has recognized the importance of cyber over the last years, um, and more and more so. Uh, so. Um, not so long time ago, we actually decided that uh, a cyber attack can trigger Article 5, uh, meaning that, that uh, we regard a uh, potential cyber attack as damaging, as serious, as, as a conventional attack. Um, so if, uh, if we have a serious cyber attack, we can design to trigger uh, Article 5, uh, uh, one for all, all for one, as our collective defense clause. Uh, we don't have to respond in cyber. That's up to us to decide. 
uh, but the cyber attack can trigger Article uh, uh, 5. And that, and that demonstrates the seriousness uh, of a potential uh, cyber attack. Um, cyber attacks takes place uh, daily, uh, uh, so we cannot trigger uh, Article 5 every day. Uh, but we send the message that if needed, we trigger Article 5 as response to a, a cyber attack. Uh, second, uh, we have established cyber as operational domain uh, uh, alongside land, air, and uh, 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 sea. Uh, and that's in a way to, 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 to make sure that we have the best way to organize, to plan, to exercise uh, our cyber defenses. <clears throat> and it is absolutely impossible to foresee a conflict in the future which doesn't include a, a cyber dimension, uh, because it is so important for everything we do. Uh, and of course, cyber is also integrated in our other capabilities, uh, our new uh, aircraft, uh, our ships, uh, whatever it is, they have cyber elements, they have cyber uh, as a part of what they do, uh, and therefore cyber uh, is, uh, is extremely important uh, for uh, the whole, uh, um, also for all our defense capabilities. Uh, <clears throat> we have also created a new cyberspace uh, operations center, and we have established a malware um, uh, information sharing platform, where we're also working with the European Union to share uh, real-time information about malware cyber attacks. We also have teams where we can deploy help allies which are under cyber attacks. Um, um, the last thing I would say is that perhaps the most important thing is that we, we share best practices. We help each other and we have big uh, exercises. Uh, uh, because cyber is part about defending the NATO networks, the NATO operations, the NATO missions, but of course it's also very much about helping allies to defend their systems. Uh, and we do that by uh, sharing information, by, by, by conducting exercises and sharing best uh, practices and constantly adapting and improving uh, the way uh, we uh, do cyber defenses in NATO. Uh, sorry, one more last thing, and that is that we have also uh, started to integrate what we call uh, national cyber effects, uh, sometimes also referred to as offensive cyber in, in, into our planning uh, <clears throat> and our missions and operations. Um, uh, we have seen the importance of these kind of cyber effects in fighting Daesh ISIS. Uh, NATO allies uh, were instrumental in, in, in attacking the, uh, the, the home pages, the networks, the cyber capabilities of Daesh, uh, 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 also um, in Iraq and Syria. That was of great importance because Daesh, ISIS used cyber to recruit, to, to, to spread their information, uh, to finance uh, and to conduct operations. So be able to penetrate these systems <clears throat> with offensive cyber is also part of uh, what NATO allies uh, do and where NATO is working together uh, 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 on these issues. Um, on space, um, so space, what happens in space is important for what goes on on the earth. Communications, uh, GPS, uh, 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 intelligence, uh, surveillance, <coughs> uh, 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 all of that is dependent on different space capabilities. And, uh, and you are right that there are different allies have a lot of different capabilities. One of the purposes of establishing space as a domain and also strengthening the focus on space in NATO is not for NATO to develop space capabilities, but it is for NATO to make sure that NATO allies work more closely together uh, learn from each other, coordinate more their efforts, and that we can share information uh, and, uh, and support uh, the activities we have uh, with uh, uh, different space uh, capabilities. So, uh, so uh, uh, this is in the, I say, <clears throat> the first steps. We have just recently established a, um, a space center uh, at our base in Rammstein, uh, uh, and then we'll go step by step uh, uh, filling this framework of uh, space as operational domain with more and more con content, uh, but it's very much about mobilizing, working together with allies and trying to coordinate their efforts in a better way. Let me just end by saying that this has been a great honor to address this, uh, this uh, distinguished uh, uh, audience and to, and to listen to your questions. I hope that at some time I can meet you in person. 
Uh, and uh, in the meantime, we are, you are more than welcome. And I'm actually looking forward to that uh, Seance Paul will participate in the NATO hackathon, uh, which is for the first time ever a way to try to invite students uh, and also then from, from Seance Paul to take part in, in, in developing new ideas, disruptive ideas for NATO and, uh, and make sure that the young, young gener generation have their say in the development of uh, the future of uh, NATO. But once again, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it has been a great, uh, uh, great thing to meet you all. And uh, and uh, Enrico, it has been great to see you, uh, uh, see you again, and uh, all the best. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for your generosity. You you answered uh, twenty six questions, uh, so I think it's it's a record uh, in. Uh, around one hour, uh, so very, very good, very good kickoff. Now it's time for panels, and then uh, uh, 4.15 uh, Paris time, we will have Joseph Borrell, and 5 uh, Paris time, we will have Florence Parley. Thank you, thank you so much. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Yeah.